uh, so now we're continuing our series called All Things New. And this has been our series going through the book of John. And, uh, and we, because it's kind of a longer series, we decided to focus in and, and do a, a more intense study of the, the encounters with Jesus, the Jesus, Jesus encounters. And uh, who, who was here last week and heard Amanda preach? Wasn't that incredible? It's, it's never easy to get up here and, and bring the word, and, and it was powerful. It was powerful. So if you didn't get a chance to see it, um, check it out online. And even if you did, check it out online again. Uh, it, it was just awesome. So thank you. She brought the, uh, the Jesus encounter of, of when uh, Jesus encountered the woman caught in adultery. And, uh, and it, was, it was powerful. There's something for us all in that. Um, I highly recommend checking that out. This morning... I, I have another pretty, pretty weighty scripture. I'm talking about um, when Jesus encounters the man who was born blind. And, uh, and I, I could preach a very fluffy message about how Jesus opens our eyes and, and he's a worker of miracles and all those things are, are true. But, but I, like what God's given me to share this morning is a little heavier than that. And, um, and, and so I want to just give a little bit of the background and then I'm going to pray because I need it. And then, and then we're going to dive into this story, okay? So, so basically, Jesus is in Jerusalem while the story is going on. And he just finished saying, um, before Abraham was, I am. And when he said that, he really was, was speaking to a group of people that would know that when he said, I am, he meant Jehovah, Yahweh. I am God. And the response to that was we want to kill him. That was, that was the response. The, they did not believe him and they wanted to stone him. But, but Jesus, he's, I don't know if he can just go into stealth mode or, or if he was just like really intimidating, but, but somehow he just kind of got away. He, he removed himself from the crowd. Um, I'm going to go with stealth mode. I'm going to go with stealth mode on this one. And, uh, and so this, this is, the, this is the, the setting that Jesus is going to do this, this work. And I believe he's setting up a conversation. I believe Jesus is brilliant. I think you should too. And, and I think he was very intentional about a lot of the things he did in this story. And, um, and so this is the backdrop for, for this, this discussion. It was, it was supercharged to the point where anyone that would say, I, I'm following Jesus would be kicked out of the synagogue. And uh, I mean, right now we live in a pretty supercharged society, right? I mean, you can't, you can't say who you stand for politically without, like, having repercussions. You can't, you can't say what your stance is, even, even if it's just an opinion. You can't, you can't really say your mind or your heart in, in a public setting without being instantly branded in a particular way. So, so we didn't invent that. That's been going on for a long time. And, and so this is the culture, this is the... the um, the setting for, for Jesus' story. So I'm going to pray, and then we're going to dive in, all right? Whew, God, we, uh, we believe that you want to do something really, really amazing this morning. We believe that you've already started in the, in the worship and the praise. We believe that, that you've started, you've, you've heard our prayers, that you've heard the cries of our heart, and, and, and now I'm, I'm just praying, God, that you would allow me to communicate your scriptures clearly, passionately, and... Uh, and truthfully, God. God, I pray that each and every one of us would have a Jesus encounter this morning, that we would be um, impacted forever, changed, transformed, molded, and shaped by you, the master creator, the king, our Lord and Savior. Jesus, we pray this in your name. Amen. Um, if you have your Bibles, please open them up to John chapter 9. We are going to go through the whole chapter. So wish me Luck or bless me or something. Um, all right, so let's start in verse 1. Uh, as he, Jesus, passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Who sinned? Um, so I just want to stop there. This is a very common theological stance back in, in Jesus' day. The rabbis were, were all about, um, I think, helping God out a little bit because God's good, after all, but, but there are people that are uh, damaged. So, so there must be a reason, and so they, they tried to help God out a little bit. How many people know 
God doesn't need any help. Uh, but, but they tried to build on what, what God had, had said in his scriptures in the Old Testament. And, uh, and they, they came up with this philosophy, this theological stance that if someone is born with a deformity, they're clearly broken. And so, so there, there needs to be a reason. And that reason is sin. That, that it was their fault or the parents' fault. And so this was this debate, you know, like what came first, the chicken or the egg? Like who sinned? Was it him? Or like what, did he sin in the womb? Or was his, his parents that sinned? Was, like whose fault is this man's blindness? He has a deformity. He's broken. There's someone to blame. Who is it? And that's, that's what they believed. And so, so they asked a question, and it was, it was a bad question. Like, you know, my mom always said it doesn't hurt to ask. That is so, like, I love you, mom. Not true. Like, it, sometimes there's some bad questions. It, it, does, it does hurt. You're like, you know, are, oh, like, what do you do? Oh, you're not pregnant. There are some times when it hurts to ask. <laughs> and uh, and so, so this is one of those, those uh, instances. But, I mean, thank goodness Jesus was there. They, they brought their, their difficulties to Jesus. And, and, and that's what we need to do. I, I think the, the worst thing possible, even worse than, than um, asking wrong questions, would be to, to, to not ask them to the right people. Right? I, I think so many times, I don't know if you've had this, but I've had this, where I've really wrestled with something theologically, and I decided to wrestle with it on my own. It doesn't work. You just get more and more depressed and you feel further and further from God and you just, you just, like you open up your Bible and it's just dead and it's boring and it's dry and you try to sing these songs like, God, I give you my heart. And you're like, yeah, that's not true. This isn't authentic. This isn't real. And, and, and what happens is, is you just get further and further. And, and what God's saying is, it's great to wrestle with these problems. Just, just bring them to me. So, so you can actually say, God, I don't like what you're doing, but I trust you. Show me where, where I'm, I'm disagreeing with you and, and correct me. Bring me into a right understanding of your will and your ways. And when we do that, like prayer is really powerful and effective. When we prayed for Iraq this morning, there was, there was something that, that happened. And something will happen when you bring your difficulties to God. It's just, it's just a truth. Um, so, so they said, who sinned? This person uh, or, or his parents? And, uh, and so, so Jesus responded. And, and it's beautiful. Uh, in verse 3, it says this. Um, it was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must Work the works of him who sent me while it, is, while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Very layered passage here. Um, I'm just going to try to glaze over it super fast. Uh, basically, Jesus was saying, I'm, I'm God. I'm God. Okay, moving on. Um, <laughs> No, no, no. I, it was not that this guy sinned, but, but, but God's work is about to be put on display. Now, this is a really, really tricky thing because we could start asking some wrong questions here. We, we could start asking some really difficult questions like, like um, what kind of a God would make this man blind and have his whole life, I mean, he's probably 30 40 years old, how could he live a whole life, be blind, just so that Jesus could show off? That would be an example of a wrong question. And we do this all the time. God, how, how could you let my family member die? How could you do that? How could you, they were a child, God. How could you do that to a child? We live in a broken Broken world. And the truth is, is that the center of everything is not your comfort. At the center of everything is the glory of God. And I'm not saying that when, when, when these tragedies happen, that, that 
that, that was God saying, yes, this is great. No, God is weeping, he is crying, he is, he is brokenhearted because this world is broken and he's called you and me to put it back together. The center of the reason for everything is not sin, but God's glory. Are you okay with that? Nate prayed a beautiful prayer this, this morning. You know, like, we, we don't always get everything we want in every moment, but we do get Jesus. And that's, I mean, we get Jesus. We get Jesus. And so we, we see Jesus setting something up. We must do the work, the work, the work. He's talking about work. And this is a Sunday, as we're going to find out soon. And so in verse 6, he continues. Having said these things, he spit on the ground and made mud with the saliva. He then anointed the man's eyes with the mud and said to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. Once again, loaded, loaded, loaded passage. Uh, he spit on the ground. This is an odd scene. There's no other miracles that, that we, we know of from Jesus' ministry here on earth that are, that's anything like this. So I must think that it was intentional. Yeah? Jesus is intentional. He's not just weird and random. He's brilliant. And he only does what the Father tells him to do. He only listens to the Holy Spirit. He, he, while he's on earth, he is obedient and so I don't think that he was trying to mix things up. And I don't think this was one of those moments where he was like, I don't know what he's doing, but I'm just going to obey. No, I, I believe that he knew exactly what was going on in the fullness of it. And, and when he began to spit into the ground, he was creating what was just like in the beginning when it says that, that out of the dust of the ground, there was, there was a mist that covered the earth and, and, and out of the dust, God created man. He just got done saying, before Abraham was, I am. And now he's giving a, a living, breathing, walking example that is going to set Jerusalem on fire conversationally about what he is and who he is. And those who have eyes to see, those who have the ears to hear, will know. So he's showing that he is the creator. But what's beautiful is, is he gives this man, this, this guy who's born blind, he gives him a mission. He sends him to the pool called Scent. And I love just the compactness of this. So he went and washed and came back seeing. Obedience has an immediate effect. I... Uh, I have, I have a little experience with, with this, actually. And, uh, you know, there's, there's a time when you see a miracle that, that you didn't expect, that you didn't fully understand, but, but it's, it's shocking and it's, and it's beautiful. And uh, do, do we have those, those pictures? I, I want to I show you a picture of this, this woman. This woman, very difficult to see, but uh, uh, believe me. It, could you slow down there for a second? All right, so, so this woman is, is from a, a, a town... Um, way off the, the main road in a, in a place of Uganda called Kabale. And we were doing a gospel festival in this, this area. And we just wanted to walk around and just pray for people and bless them. And uh, we, we found this, this woman and she was, she was blind. She couldn't see. And, uh, and I was there with, with, my, with my dad, which was great. And then my, my, um, my, my wife was there with me as well. And so we just met this woman and she was so sweet and so loving and, and wonderful, and she just wanted to have us come into her home, and she wouldn't let us leave without blessing her home, and, and so, so we, we did that. So if you can go to the next picture. Um, I'm sorry, these are so dark, but yeah, so, so if you could see, you could see that her eyes are just like, they're, they're not really engaged with you. Like she's, the, the camera's out there, but she, she can't see it, and it's just um, it's just distant. And so we, could you go to the next picture? We, we decided to, to pray for her. Now, I'm the international director for, for this mission, which meant that it was my job to pray. And so, so like, I, I prayed. Like, you know, they said, Corey's going to pray for you. And, uh, well, you know, Pastor Mac. Um, Pastor Mac is going to pray for you. And, and so I prayed. And, 
and then if you go to the next, next picture, once again, it's really hard to see, but, but she's, she was so sweet. She wanted so desperately to like make us feel like we were doing good, you know? And, and, and she's like, oh, I feel so much better. Thank you. You know, all, all through a translator, we, we couldn't understand what she was saying. And, uh, and, then, and then we said, like, you know what? This is not okay. This is not okay with us. We're going to pray one more time. And, and I was like, it's not just going to be me praying. Like, we're all going to pray all at the same time. And we're going to pray good. I mean, we're going to pray, like, heaven come down to, to earth. And so we, we pray. Go to the next picture. So we, like, pray again. And this time, it is just like, God, pour out your healing power right now in this spot. Out of all the places in Uganda, right here, bring healing here to this woman. Show your love and compassion on this woman. And then if you go to the next, next picture, she, her eyes were opened. And, and she instantly recognized the, the, the pastor that was there with us. And she's like, ah, pastor, so good to see you. And, and, and it was just this amazing, joyful, like we, we didn't even know how to react to it. Yeah. And, and I mean, I'm saying, I'm bragging on God here. Absolutely bragging on, on God. And, and we, we just saw this woman's eyes open up. And then all of a sudden she told everyone in her village. And they all came down out of the, the hills. And the, the next day they, they walked and they basically lived in the town. Just basically knocking on doors of churches saying, um, we walked from the, the hills we need a place to stay. We're just going to sleep in your church. And, and they, they didn't have any food. They didn't have any guarantee of some place to stay. They came, and, and it was like the whole city was on fire with the love of God. Isn't that cool? Yeah. And so that's, that's a good response. That's a great response to a miracle. But that's not what we see here in this passage. And so uh, if you uh, can go to verse 8. All right, the neighbors of those who had seen him before as a beggar were saying, is, is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some said, uh, it is he. Others said, no, uh, but it, he's like him. Uh, he kept saying, I am the man. I, I am. I am the man. Uh, which is funny that they're like, no, you like him, but you're not really him. Um, so he answered, the man called Jesus made mud and anointed my eyes and said to me, go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, where is he? He said, I, I do not know. He was blind. He didn't know where he went. So, he, so this, is the, this is where it gets strange. They brought, so the, the Jews of Jerusalem, they, they brought to the Pharisees, the man who was formerly blind. And now it was the Sabbath day when Jesus made mud and opened his eyes. Um, now this is, this is a little, little uh, interesting tidbit. I, at first I'm like, no, he didn't really break the Sabbath. Because, you know, there's, there's, nothing, there's nothing wrong with spitting on the Sabbath. That, that's okay. Like, you know, and there's nothing, nothing. Like, but so the only way that Jesus could have broken the Sabbath, if, if according to the, the rules of the Pharisees of that time, uh, where if, if he really got up some spit and, and he started kneading, kneading dirt, like, like just, just really like going, because you're not allowed to knead bread on the Sabbath. But there's nothing wrong with like spitting. You can spit. That's fine. But, but so, so I, I don't know what really happened, but my, my guess is that, that Jesus really did some creation of dirt here. And, uh, and so, so it was the Sabbath. And uh, so the Pharisees again asked him how he received his sight. And, and he said to them, he put mud on my eyes and I washed and I see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others said, how can a man who is a sinner do such things, such signs? And there was division among them. So they said again to the blind man, what do you say about him since he opened your eyes? He said, he is a prophet? It's a totally safe answer right here. Totally safe answer. Now, he's, he's a little scared. He's, he's probably uh, at the center of everyone's attention in a room full of very influential people. He, he, he doesn't really know what to say. He's probably never seen this much activity before. I mean, he, he was born blind. 
And he's intimidated and scared. And, and I mean, he's just, he's probably overwhelmed. In every way, he's overwhelmed. And so he just says he's, he's a prophet. Um, the Jews did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they called his parents, the, the parents of the man who had received his sight, and they asked him, is this your son? This is crazy that they have to go to this length. Is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered, uh, we, we don't know. Uh, we know that this is our, our son, uh, that he was born blind, but how he now sees, we do not know, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him. He is of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said these things because they feared the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed that if anyone should confess Jesus to be Christ, he would be put out of the synagogue. Therefore, his parents said, he's of age. Ask him. This is, this is a wild situation that the parents of this, this person who had never seen, they, they should be. They should respond like the people of Kabbalah responded. They, they should have responded with, with joy, but fear prevented that. How many great responses to the moves of God have been tapered, have been rounded, have been muted by fear? I, I know of a lot of things that, that we're afraid of. We're, we're deathly uh, afraid of feeling shame. We're definitely afraid of, of feeling like we're, we're, we stick out. And, and I think some of us are afraid of just feeling like we're going with the flow, but, but sometimes the, the other fears outweigh them. But I think one of the, the fears that uh, is most dangerous, one of the fears that is most difficult is, um, is people just don't, don't want to be authentic. And, uh, and I think people are very, very, very afraid of being wrong. I think we need to get over ourselves in this one. We're going to be wrong. We're going to be wrong a lot. There's nothing wrong with saying, I was wrong. I'm not saying be wrong on purpose. I'm just saying, like, if you're, if you're, if you're witnessing something that is of God, that is a mystery, our, our natural tendency in this culture is to respond with, yeah, it's probably not God. It's probably not. And, and I understand being, being a skeptic. I, I grew up in a, in a very um, both charismatic and conservative background. My, my parents were crazy hippies that got saved in the Jesus movement. And, uh, and we went to some radically Pentecostal charismatic church services. And then... Um, and then that church blew up, as some of those churches do, sadly. And, and then uh, we went to a Christian Reformed church where I grew up as a Calvinist. And, uh, and, and this was a very grounded, I'm very grateful for the, the, the theological grounding that, that I got during these, these times. And, um, and I, I have to say that, that during that time, I became very skeptical of the moves of the Holy Spirit and and. and and one by one, all of these things that I kept saying, no, that can't be God, that can't be God, that can't be God. I, I feel like God systematically wanted to, to bring me back to the place where, no, the Bible is really true. The things that happened in the Bible still happen today. Blind eyes still get opened. The Holy Spirit is still at work. And he, he wants to use people like you and me, not just pastors, but, but he wants to use all of us together to redeem this world back to Jesus. And so, so we need to get rid of that, that fear. That fear is just, just killing us as a church. And, it, and it, was, it was killing his parents from being able to really stand with their son and say, this was a miracle. This was a beautiful thing. If Jesus was the one that opened his eyes, I'm with Jesus. They didn't do that, though. And so let's continue in verse 24. Um, For the second time they called the man who had been blind and said to him, Give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered, Whether he is a sinner, I I do not know. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. 
And even now, I, I, I hope that you, you feel there, there's just a, a truth that is there in those statements. There is an undeniability. There, there are just times when, when it's like truth comes running into the room and starts jumping on the chairs. Like you just have to respond to that level of truth. But that is not how the Pharisees responded. They said to him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? And I think this was a critical moment for this man who was born blind. See, he had always been blind. He was the blind guy. That was his identity. That's who he was. I'm blind. I sit here. I ask for money. I beg. And, and I get led to places. And that's who I am. And there's nothing that I can do to change this. I'm just the blind guy. I'm just taking up space. And all of a sudden, in this moment, he's realizing that, that he sees something that these Religious leaders don't. He's realizing that he's, he's not the blind guy anymore. He's encountered Jesus and, and he's been tr- changed. He's been transformed by this encounter. And so he answers them in verse 27. I've told you already and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? And they reviled him saying, you are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not even know where he comes from. The man answered, why, this is amazing. You don't even know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, God listens to him. Never since the world began has it ever been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. And they answered him, you were born in utter utter sin. And would you teach us? And they cast him out. And this is the ultimate example of how those bad questions with bad assumption lead to some really dark places. He was speaking truth that they needed to hear. He had already washed the mud off his eyes, but these Pharisees were standing there just caked in mud, metaphorically. But they couldn't see. They couldn't hear because they believed that he was born in sin, that he was broken and therefore he was a sinner and not worthy of being able to teach them. I think, uh, I think there's, there's a lot more parallels in this story to us than we might er- immediately respond. Like, I, I, I don't feel that if someone's blind that, that I, I feel that they're a sinner, that I, I feel that they are not worthy of my ear and my respect. That I don't, I don't think that. But there are some times when other prejudices come in the, into play. And, and we as a church need to be so vigilant to love, to, to, to give people our respect, to, to listen for how God is going to speak from anywhere or anything. God can use Donald Trump. God can use Hillary Clinton. God can use somebody that is as flamboyant as the day is long to speak to you and share his truth to you. And we need to be open to him speaking at all times, respecting all people in all ways. Because Jesus died for them and loves them and cares for them. And he told us to be his representatives here on earth. And that that doesn't only mean when they're there in front of us. That doesn't only mean when they can hear the words that we speak. I believe that's at all times. And so I want to continue in verse 39. Uh, Jesus says, uh, sorry, I want to go back to 30, 35, verse 35. So Jesus heard that they had cast him out. And having found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, And and who is he, sir, 
that I, that I may believe in him. Jesus said to him, you have seen him. You have seen him. And it is he who is speaking to you. He said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. You know, you, we could ask a lot of questions. Why would Jesus do this? Why would he have this man be blind his whole life? How could a good God, and God is good, how, how could a good God allow this man to suffer and beg day after day after day? Well, what's our priorities? Because we're talking about his life thousands of years later. He through his obedience, put an entire town on fire conversationally. And, 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 and we're still learning lessons from, from him. And his response, he got to see Jesus. He got to worship Jesus in the flesh way before most people even realized who he was. There are certain people that just... I admire so much people like, like Abraham that just loved and worshiped God and put their, his trust in him and just left in honor of a stranger. People like Moses who's like, I, I, don't, I know that if I see your face that I'm going to die. I want to see your face. I want to see it. And this, this blind guy, I just, I just want to believe in the Messiah, I want to believe in him. And, and, and the instant Jesus says, it is me, he worships. And says he believes. So is it worth it? Is it worth it? A life of blindness for a moment of seeing what the religious leaders couldn't, couldn't see. Is it worth it? Living in the dark for 30, 40 years getting kicked out of the religious community. Is it worth it? Because this guy, he could have responded, Jesus, where, where were you when I was being grilled? Where, where were you then? There's, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of room in our community today for the victim. There's a lot of understanding and coddling of, of the victim. I, I don't see that in Scripture. I, I, I see... Jesus saying, come to me. My burden is easy and my yoke is light. Cast your burdens on me and I, I, I will take them away. Seek me and you will find me if you seek me with all your heart. This is the Jesus I know, but it's, it's not, oh, so sorry. That's not, that's not the kingdom way of life. Um, so is it worth it? Can we trust God enough to go, yes. Glory to God is a higher priority than anything else. There's nothing that comes close. There's, there's really not even a number two. It's all just different arrows that point at giving glory to God. And I mean, I, I don't want to be up here saying that I understand it all. I don't. Why this person's born like this and that person's born like this. Why this person gets sick and doesn't get better. And why this person does. I don't understand But I don't, I don't necessarily have to. God is Father. He is King. And, and I get to trust him. And, and I've said this from this stage before. The, the Bible was not written to defend God. The Bible was, was written just to explain who he is. It, it doesn't defend whether or not he's good. It assumes that you know that God is good. And so it's just like a math equation. If, if you have x plus y equals 2, you, uh, 2 is a bad example. I'm, I'm really bad at math. This is terrible. <laughs> if, you've got two, if you've got two unknowns and, and you know the, the, what it equals, you need to know at least one of those two. And so like the, the Bible can only be fully understood if you have a grounding in the fact that God is good. If, if you think God is sort of good, it doesn't make sense because there are babies getting dashed against rocks. And so if God is sort of good 
or mostly good, or, or kind of good. That leaves room for you to just freak out and go, how, how can I serve this God? But that is not who God is. God is completely, fully, 100%, wholly good and worthy of our trust and our dependence. We can believe in him without doubt. And if God made a decision, we can know that it was the best decision possible. And so when he says the words that he's going to say next, we can, we can know that they are reliable. Because in 30, verse 39, it says this, Jesus said, For judgment I came into this world, that those who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard him uh, say these things and, and said to him, uh, Are we also blind? Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would have no guilt. But now... That you say we see, your guilt remains. Now, I mean, as you read this, you could, you could read this two ways. You, you could say that the Pharisees said, um, you know, are, are we blind? Like, like, are they really asking the question or are they making a statement? And I think Jesus' response kind of alludes to, to the way that they, they asked it. And that's why I read it the way that I did. Because um, if you were blind, you would have no guilt. But now that you say, we see, your guilt remains. Um, we, uh, we all have a little piece of this. Uh, all the time, we like to identify with Jesus in the story, right? Sometimes we like to identify with the heroes of these stories. But occasionally, just, you know, as an intellectual exercise, maybe, we should put ourselves in the shoes of the Pharisees once in a while, just to see what happens. And uh, there's, there's some things that need to wash off of us. There, there are some things in our life that, that need to go. And there, there is a dependence on God, a blind trusting that, that we need to give to God. Because I think a lot of times, and especially like in our church, we believe in prayer, right? We believe in the goodness of God. And sometimes what creeps in there is like, God, I'm believing that you are good and you are going to heal me. And that's not always the case. I, I, I know that there might be some disagreement on that, but I, I think that there's more room for the glory of God than always experiencing healing. I think that there's other ways to experience the goodness and the glory of God. I, I prayed for this one woman not long ago, and, and this is not that experience is the only way to really understand the, the truth of God. I, 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 but I mean, what else we got? We got our experiences and we got the scriptures. That's all we got. And, and so I was praying for this one woman, and she had been in pain. She, she was experiencing cancer, and she had been in pain for 20 years straight, agonizing pain. And, uh, and so I, I went, and they were, this was a church in, in Michigan. They were doing a, uh, a series on the Holy Spirit. And so they said, hey, would you pray for these people to get healed? And I'm like, yeah, that's nerve-wracking. And, and so, so I, I, I prayed with all faith that God take away this woman's pain. Just, just like we prayed for, for the woman in Kabbalah, Uganda, I prayed that God take away her pain. Pain, go away right now, Jesus, in your name. Give us another testimony of, of your healing power and your glory. And I prayed as, as all out as I knew how to pray. And, uh, and we got done. And she's like, my cataract disappeared. Which was weird. Because the pain was still there. She was still in agonizing pain. God did a miracle. But he did not do the miracle that we prayed for. And I... I I'm only saying this because we live in a broken world. God has not come back to, to fix it fully. And there are moments when the kingdom of God crashes into earth and we get to experience that in its fullness. But then, but then we move. I, I, I think we move. And, and, and God is, is continuing to, to bring his, his kingdom to earth. But, but it's not here in its full sense yet. And that's, that's what heaven's going to be like. Experiencing the fullness of God in every single moment, every day being greater than the last. So, 
are you okay with this? Are you okay with not getting everything that you want in that moment always? I hope, I hope you are. In, uh, in Hebrews, I'm actually going to have the, the worship team come on up. Um, in, uh, in Hebrews chapter 3, it says this, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. We, we talked today about a guy who, who was blind from, from birth. And there's many people in this room that while we all see, I, I, I don't think anyone struggles in that exact same way, um, there are areas in our life where we don't see so clearly. And, and there are areas in my life where I don't see so clearly. And if some of those came out while I was preaching this morning, I ask for grace. But we're all, we're all in process. We're all seeking God. We're all pursuing him. And, and if you're not pursuing God, if you're not seeking him, I'm, I'm telling you today that he loves you, that he cares for you, that, that he wants to be your father, and that he wants to use you to, to be a blessing to this world. He's got a plan for you. That you're not just taking up space. That you're very meaningful. You're very useful to him and to this, this world. Um, and so I'm, I'm going to ask that, that we all, let's, let's just stand together while uh, the worship team is getting set up. And, and let's, let's just pray. Because I, I feel like there are some things, some, some blind spots that God wants to get at this morning. And... Uh, if, if you need prayer for, for anything, I'm going to be right over here. And then after the service, we're going to, we're going to as always, open it up for, for prayer. But, but if you're just realizing I've got a blind spot that I need to uh, just ask for God to get rid of, um, let's, let's start here in this moment. And if you need to continue that after the service, we, we definitely will. So let's just pray. God, I pray that you, in your powerful, powerful way, would do what only you can do and open the eyes of the blind. Even now, just begin to speak. Speak to your children. We're, we're your sons and we're your daughters. Open our eyes. For some people in this room, that means physical healing. And I, I, just, I just pray right now that you bring physical healing to people in this room. Just like you brought physical healing to this man born blind. That was not only so that people could understand that, that they were theologically blind. No, it was also to show that you heal. But many of us, God, are also struggling with, with a blindness that is, that is deeper. So you are the light of the world. Shine your light on us so that we also can be the light of the world as we reflect your light, as we shine with your light, as we, as we stand like a city on a hill, as we shine like stars in the universe, as your scripture says. God, I, I just pray that you would pour out your spirit even now and that we would respond with praise and worship and adoration and love. Jesus, we pray this in your name. Amen.